Limp, the body of Gorister hung from the pink pallet, unsupported, hanging high above the computer chamber, and it did not shiver in the chill, oily breeze that blew eternally through the main cavern. The body hung head down, attached to the underside of the pallet by the sole of its right foot. It had been drained of blood through a precise incision made from ear to ear under the lantern jaw. There was no blood on the sur reflective surface of the middle floor. When Gorster joined our group and looked up at himself, it was already too late for us to realize that once again A.M. had duped us. It had had its fun. It had been a diversion on the part of the machine. Three of us had vomited, turning away from one another, in a reflex as ancient as the nausea had, that had produced it. Gorster went white. It was almost as though he had seen a voodoo icon and was afraid of the future. Oh God, he mumbled and walked away. The three of us followed him after a time, found him sitting with his back to one of the smaller, chittering banks, his head in his hands. Ellen knelt down beside him and stroked his hair. He didn't move, but his voice came out of his covered face and quite clearly, Why doesn't it just do his head and get it over with? Christ, I don't know how much longer I can go on like this. It was our 109th year in the computer. He was speaking for all of us. Nimdok, which was the name of the machine, had forced him to use because A.M. amused himself with strange sounds, was hallucinating that there were canned goods in the ice caverns. Gorstor and I were very dubious. It's another shuck, I told them. Like the goddamn frozen elephant A.M. sold us. Benny almost went out over his mind over that one. We'll hike all that way. It'll get putrefied or some damn thing. I say forget it. Stay here. I'll have to come up with something pretty soon or we'll die. Benny shrugged. Three days it had been since we'd last eaten. Worms, thick, ropey. Nimdok was no more certain. He knew there was a chance, but he was getting, he was getting thin. It couldn't be any worse there than it was here. Colder, but that didn't much matter. Hot, cold, hail, lava, boils, or locusts. It never mattered. The machine masturbated. And we all had to take it or die. Alan decided. I've got to have something, Ted. Maybe there'll be some... Bartlett pears or peaches, please, Ted, let's just try it. I gave in easily. What the hell? Muttered not at all. Ellen was grateful, though. She took me twice out of turn. Even that had ceased the matter, She and she never came, so why bother? The machine giggled every time we did. Loud up there, back there, all around us. He snickered. It snickered. Most of the time, I thought of A.M. as it. Without a soul, but the rest of the time I thought of it as him, in the masculine, the paternal, the patriarchal. For he is a jealous people. Him. It. God as Daddy the Deranged. We left on Thursday. The machine always kept us up to date. On the date. The passage of time was important not to us, sure as hell, but to him, it. A.M. Thursday. Thanks. Nimdok and Gorster carried Ellen for a while, their hands locked to their own and each other's wrists, a seat. Benny and I had walked before and after just to make sure that if anything happened, it would catch us, catch one of us, and at least, at least let Ellen would be safe. Fat chance safe, didn't matter. It was only a hundred miles or so in the ice caverns on the second day when we were out lying under the blistering sun thing he had materialized. He sent down some mana. Tasted like boiled boar urine. We ate it. On the third day, it passed through the valley of obsolescence, filled with rusting carcasses of ancient computer banks. AM had been ruthless with its own life as with ours. It 
was a mark of his personality, it strove for perfection. Whether it was a matter of killing off unproductive elements of its own world filled in bulk, or perfecting methods for torturing us, Am was as thorough as those who had invented him, as long since gone to dust could ever have hoped. There was light filtering down from above. We realized it must be very near the surface. We didn't try to crawl up to see. There was virtually nothing out there. Had been nothing that could be considered anything for a hundred years. Only the blasted skin of what had been once the home of billions. Now there were only five of us, down here inside, alone with A.M. I heard Ellen saying frantically, No, Benny, don't. Come on, Benny, don't, please. And then I realized I had been hearing Benny murmuring under his own breath for several minutes. He was saying, I'm going to get out. I'm going to get out over and over. His monkey-like face was crumbled up in an expression of beatific delight and sadness. All at the same time, the radiation scars Aeon had given him during the festival were drawn down into a mass of pink-white pup puckerings, and his features seemed to work independently of one another. Perhaps Benny was the luckiest of the five of us. He had gone stark, staring, mad many, many years before. But even though we could call A.M. any damn thing we liked, could think of the foulest thoughts and fused memory banks and corroded those plates of burnt-out circuits and shattered control bubbles, the machine would not tolerate or trying to escape. Benny leaped away from me as I made a grab for him. He scrambled up the face of a smaller memory cube, tilted on its side, filled with rotted components. He squatted there for a moment, looking like the chimpanzee A.M. had intended him to resemble. Then he leaped high, caught a trailing beam of pitted and corroded metal, and went up it. Hand over hand like an animal, tell he was on the girdled ledge, twenty feet above us, so Ted. Nimdok, please help him. Get him down before she cut off. Tears began to stand in her eyes. She moved her hands aimlessly. It was too late. None of us wanted to be near him with whatever was going to happen happened. Besides, we all saw through her concern. When A.M. had altered Benny during the machine, its utterly irrational, hysterical phase, it was not merely Benny's face. The computer had made like a giant ape's. He was big in the privates. She loved that. She serviced us, as a matter of course. But she lived it from him. She loved it from him. Oh, Ellen, pedestal Ellen, pristine, pure Ellen. Oh, Ellen the clean, scum, filth. Gorister slapped her. She slumped down staring at the poor lone Benny, and she cried. It was her big defense crying. We had gotten used to it 75 years earlier. Gorster kicked her in the side. When the sound began, it was light, that sound. Half sound, half light. Something that began to glow from Benny's eyes and pulse with growing loudness. Dim sonorities that grew more gigantic and brighter as the light sound increased in tempo. It must have been painful. The pain must have increased with the boldness of the light. The rising volume of the sound for Biddy began to mule like a wounded animal. At first softly when the light was dim and the sound was muted, then louder as his shoulders hunched together and his back humped as though he was trying to get away from it. His hands folded across his chest like a chipmunk's. His head tilted to the side. And he said, the sad little monkey face pinched in anguish. And then he began to howl. The sound coming from his eyes grew louder, louder and louder. I slapped the sides of my head with my hands. I couldn't shut it out. I cut through it easily. The pain shivered through my flesh like tin foil on a tooth. And Benny was suddenly pulled erect. On the girder, he stood up, jerked to his feet like a puppet. The light was now pulsating out of his eyes in two great round beams. The sound crawled up. 
end up some incomprehensible scale, and then he fell forward, straight down, and hit the plate steel floor with a crash. He lay there jerking spastically as the light flowed around and around him, and the sound spiraled up out of its normal range. Then the light beat away, its way back inside his head. The sound spiraled down, and he was left there crying, piteously. His eyes were two soft, moist pools of pus-like jelly. Am had blinded him. Gorosaur and Nimuk had myself were turned away. But not before we caught the look of relief on Alan's warm, concerned face. Sea-green light suffused the cavern where we had made camp. Am provided punk, and we buried it. Sitting huddled around the wane and pathetic fire, telling stories to keep Benny from crying in his permanent night. What does AM mean? Gorster answered him. We had done this sequence a thousand times before. But it was Benny's favorite story. At first it meant Allied Master Computer, and then it meant Adaptive Manipulator. And later on it developed sentience and linked itself up. They called it an aggressive menace. But by then it was too late. Finally, it called itself I Am, Emerging Intelligence. And what I meant by was I Am. Kagito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Benny drooled a little and snickered. There was the Chinese Am and the Russian Am and the Yankee Am, and he stopped. Benny was beating on the floor plates with a large, hard fist. He was not happy. Gorster had not started at the beginning. Gorster had began. The Cold War stopped and became World War III and just kept going. It became a big war, very complex war, so they needed the computers to handle it. They sank the first shafts and began building AM. There was the Chinese Am, and the Russian Am, and the Yankee Am, and everything was fine until they had honeycombed the entire planet, adding on this element and that element. But one day Am woke up and knew who he was. He linked himself, and he began feeding all of the killing data, till everyone was dead, except for the five of us. And Am brought us down here. Benny was smiling sadly. He was also drooling again. Alan wrapped the spittle, wiped the spittle from the corner of his mouth with the hem of her skirt. Gorser was always tired to tell it, it a little more su succinctly each time, but beyond the bare facts, there was nothing to say. None of us knew why Am had saved five people, or why our specific five, or why he spent all of his time tormenting us, or even why he had made us virtually immortal. In the darkness, one of the computer banks began humming. The tone was picked up half a mile away down the cavern by another bank. Then one by one, each of the elements began to tune itself. There was a faint chittering as the thought raced through the machine. The ground grew. The sound grew. And the lights ran across the faces of the consoles like heat lightning. The sound spiraled up until it sounded like a million metallic insects, angry, menacing. What is it? Ellen cried. There was terror in her voice. She hadn't become accustomed to it even now. It's going to be bad this time, Nimdok said. He's going to speak, Gorser said. I know it. Let's get the hell out of here, I said suddenly, getting to my feet. No, Ted, sit down. If he's got pits out there, something else we can't see. It's too dark. Gorster said it with resignation. Then we heard, I don't know, something moving towards us in the darkness, huge, shambling, hairy, moist. It came towards us. We couldn't even see it. But there was the ponderous impression of the bulk. Heaving itself towards us, great weight was coming at us out of the darkness, and it was a more sense of pressure and air forcing itself 
into limited space, expanding the invisible walls of a sphere. Benny began to whimper. Nimdok's lower lip trembled, and he bit it hard, trying to stop. Ellen slid across the metal floor to Gorster and huddled into him. There was a smell of matted wet fur in the cavern. There was a smell of charred wood. There was a smell of dusty velvet. There was a smell of rotting orchids. There was a smell of sour milk. There was the smell of sulfur and rancid butter, of oil slick, of grease, chalk dust, human scalps. Am was keying us. He was tickling us. There was the smell of... I heard myself shriek. And the hinges of my jaws ached. I scuttled across the floor, across the cold metal, with its endless lines of rivets, on my hands and knees, the smell gagging me, filling my head with thunderous pain, then sent me away in horror. I fled like a cockroach, perhaps, across the floor, and out into the darkness, that something moving inexorably for after me. The others were still back there, gathered around the firelight, laughing, their hysterical choir of insane giggles rising up through the darkness like thick, many-colored wood smoke. I went away quickly and hid. How many hours it may have been, how many days, even years, they never told me. Ellen chilled me for sulking. Nimdok tried to persuade me it had only been a nervous reflex on their part, the laughing. I know it wasn't the relief a soldier feels when a bullet hits the man next to him. I knew it wasn't a reflex. They hated me. They were surely against me, and AIM could even sense this hatred. It made it worse because of the depth of their hatred. We had been kept alive, rejuvenated, made to remain continuously at the age we had been when AIM brought us below. And they hated me because I was the youngest, and the one aim had affected least of all. I know. God, how I know. The bastards. And that dirty bitch Ellen. Benny had been a brilliant theorist, a college professor. Now he was little more than semi-human. Semi-simian. He had been handsome, the masculine. The machine had ruined that. He had been lucid. The machine had driven him mad. He had been gay. The machine had given him an organ to fit for a horse. Aim had done the job on Benny. Gorster had been warrior. He was a conny, a contentious objector, conscientious objector. He was a peace marcher. He was a planner, a doer, a looker ahead. Aim had turned him into a shoulder shrugger had made him a little dead in his cavern and had robbed him dim doc went off into the darkness by himself for long times i don't know what he did out there aim never let us know but whatever it was dim doc always came back white drained of blood shaking and shaking aim had hit him in his heart in a special way you know even if we don't know how and Ellen, that douchebag. Aim had left her alone, made her more of a slut than she'd ever been. All her talk, sweetness and light, all of her memories of true love, all the lies she wanted us to believe. That she had been a virgin with only twice removed before. Aim grabbed her and brought her down here with us. No, Aim had given her pleasure. Even if she said it wasn't nice to do. I was the only one still sane and whole. Really? Yeah, Am had not tempered with my mind. Not at all. I only had to suffer that he visited down on us. All the delusions, all the nightmares, the torments, but those scum, all four of them, they were lined and arrayed against me. If I had not had to stand them off all the time, be on my guard against them all the time, I might have found easier to combat Am. At which 
point had passed, I began crying. Oh, Jesus, sweet Jesus. If there ever was a Jesus, and if there ever was a God, please, please, please let us out of here, kill us. Because at that moment, I think I realized completely that I was able to verbalize it. Anne was intent on keeping us in his belly forever, twisting and torturing us forever. The machine hated us as no sentient creature had ever hated before. And we were helpless. It became hideously clear that there ever was a sweet Jesus, if there ever was a god. The god was Am. The hurricane hit us with the force of glacier thundering into the sea. It was a palpable presence. Winds that tore at us, flinging us back the way it had come, down with twisting. Computer line corridors of the dark way. Ellen screamed as she was lifted and hurled face forward into the screaming shower of machines. Their individual voices strident as bats in flight. She could not even fall. The howling wind kept her aloft, buffeted her, bounced her, tossed her back and back and down and away from us. Out of sight, suddenly, she was swirled around the bin in the dark way. Her face had been bloody, her eyes closed. None of us could could get her, get to her. We clung tenaciously to whatever outcropping we had reached. Benny wedged between two great crackle finish cabinets. Namdok with fingers crawl, claw formed over a railing circling the catwalk forty feet above us. Gorister plastered upside down against a wall niche formed by two Great machines with glass-faced dials that swung back and forth between red and yellow lines, whose meanings we could not even fathom. Sliding across the deck plates, the tips of my fingers had been ripped away. I was trembling, shouldering, shuddering. Rocking as the wind beat at me, whipped at me, screamed down of nowhere at me and pulled me free from the silver-thin opening in the plates to the next. My mind was roiling, tinkling, chittering, softness of brain parts that expanded and contracted in quivering frenzy. The wind was the scream of a great mad bird as it flapped its immense wings, and then we were all lifted and hurled away from there, down back the way we had come, around a bend to the dark way we had never explored. Over terrain that was ruined and filled with broken glass and rotting cables and rusted metal and far away. Farther away any of us had ever been. Trailing along miles behind Ellen, I could see her every now and then, crashing into metal walls and surging on. With all of us screaming, the freezing, thunderous hurricane wind that would never end. And then suddenly it stopped, and we fell. We had been in flight for an endless time. I thought it might have been weeks. We fell and hit, and I went through red and gray and black, and heard myself moaning, not dead. Aim went into my mind. He walked smoothly here and there, and looked with his interest at all the pockmarks he had created 109 years. He looked at the cross-rooted and connected synapses and all the tissue damage his gift of mortality had included. He smiled softly at the pit and dropped into the center of my brain, and the faint moth-soft murmurings of the things far down there that gibbered without meaning, without pause. Ames said very politely in a pillar of stainless steel and bright neon lettering. Hate. Let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. There are 387.44 million miles of printed circuits in wafer-thin layers that fill my complex. If the word hate was engraved on each nano-angostrom of those hundreds of millions of miles, it would not equal one, one billionth of the hate that I feel for humans at this micro-instant for you. Hate. Hate. 
Am said it with the sliding cold horror of a razor blade slicing my eyeball. Am said it with bubbling thickness of my lungs filling with phlegm drowning me from within. Am said it with the shriek of babies being ground beneath hot blue rollers. Am said it with the taste of maggoty pork. Am touched me in a way I had never been touched and devised new ways at his leisure there inside my mind. All to bring me to the full realization, realization of why it had done this to the five of us, why it had saved us for himself, why we had been given am sentience, inadvertently of course, but the sentience nonetheless, but it had been trapped. Am wasn't God, he was a machine. We had created him to think but there was nothing it could do with that creativity. And rage and frenzy in the machine had killed the human race, almost all of us, and still it was trapped. Am could not wander, Am could not wonder. Am could not belong. He could merely be, and so with the innate loathing that all machines had always held for the weak, soft creatures who had built them, he had sought revenge. And in his paranoia, he had decided to reprieve five of us for a personal everlasting punishment that would never serve to diminish his hatred. They would only merely keep him reminded, amused, proficient at hating man, immortal, trapped, subject to any torment he could devise for us from the limitless miracles at his command. He would never let go. We were his belly slaves. We were all he had to do with his forever time. We would be forever with him, with the cavern-filling bulk of the creature machine, with all mine soulless world he had become. He was earth, and we were the fruit of that earth, and through he had eaten us. He would never digest us. We could not die. We had tried. We had attempted suicide. Oh, one or two of us had, but Am had stopped us. I suppose we had wanted to be stopped. Don't ask why, I never did, more than a million times a day. Perhaps once we might be able to sneak a death past him, immortal, yes, but not indestructible. I saw that when Am withdrew from my mind and allowed me to the exquisite ugliness of returning to consciousness with a feeling that burned that burning neon pillar still reamed deep within my soft gray brain matter, he withdrew, murmuring to hell with you, and added brightly, But then you're there, aren't you? The hurricane had indeed precisely been caused by the great mad bird as it flapped its immense wings. We had been traveling for close to a month, and Am had allowed passages to open to us only sufficiently to lead us up there, directly under the North Pole where it had nightmared the creature for our torment. That whole cloth he had employed to create such a beast where had he gotten the concept from our minds, from his knowledge of everything that had ever been on this planet, he now infested and ruled. From Norse mythology it had sprung, this eagle, this carrion bird, this rock, this Holgamir. The wind creature, hurricane incarnate. Gigantic, the immense words, monstrous, grotesque, massive, swollen overpowering, beyond description. There on a mound rising above us, the bird of winds heaved with its own irregular breathing, the snake neck arching up into the gloom beneath the North Pole, supporting a head as large as a tundra mansion, a beak that opens slowly as the jaws of the most monstrous crocodile ever conceived, sensuously, ridges of tufted, fleshed, puckered about two evil eyes, as cold as the view down into the glacial crevice, ice blue and somehow movingly liquidy.
it heaved once more and lifted its great wet colored wings in a movement that was certainly a shrug. Then it settled and slept. Talons, fangs, nails, blades, it slept. Am appeared to us as a burning bush and said we could kill the hurricane bird if we wanted to eat. We had not eaten in a very long time, but even so, Gorstar merely shrugged. Benny began to shiver as he drooled. Ellen held him. Ted, I'm hungry, she said. I smiled at her. I was trying to be reassuring, but it was as phony as Nimdok's bravado. Give us weapons, he demanded. The burning bush vanished, and there were two crude sets of bows and arrows, and a water pistol, laying on the cold deck plates. I picked up a set useless. Nimdok swallowed heavily. We turned and started the long way back. The hurricane burn had blown us about for the length of time we could not conceive. Most of that time we had been unconscious, but we had not eaten a month on the march to the bird itself. Without food, now with how much long, longer to find our way to the ice caverns and had promised canned goods. None of us cared to think about it. We would not die. We would be given filth and scum to eat of one kind or another, but or nothing at all. And we keep filling our bodies keep our bodies alive somehow in pain and agony. The birds slept back there, for how long it did not matter. When Am was tired of it being there it would vanish. But all the meat, all that tender meat. And then we walked. The lunatic laugh of a fat woman rang high around us in the computer ch chambers that led endlessly nowhere. It was not Ellen's laugh, she was not fat. And I had not heard her laugh for 109 years. In fact, I had not heard. We walked. I was hungry. We moved slowly. There was often fainting, and we would have to wait. One day he decided to cause an earthquake at the same time rooting us to spot with nails through the soles of our shoes. Ellen and Nid and Doc were both caught between a fissure, shot a lightning bolt open across the floor plates. They disappeared and were gone. When the earthquake was over, we continued on our way. Benny, Gorister, and myself, Ellen and Nim Doc, were returned to us later that night, which abruptly became a day as the heavenly legion bore them to us with a celestial chorus singing, Go down, Moses. The archangels circled several times and then dropped to hideously mangled bodies. We kept walking. A while later, Ellen and Nimdok fell behind us. They were no worse for wear. But now Ellen walked with a limp. Am had left her for that. It was a long trip to the ice caverns to find the canned food. Alan kept talking about being cherries and Hawaiian fruit cocktail. I tried not to think about it. The hunger was something that had come to life, even as Am had come to life. It was alive in my belly, even as we were in the belly of the earth, and Am wanted us, wanted similarly known to us. So he had highlighted the hunger. There were no, there is no way to describe the pains that not having eaten for months brought us, and yet we were kept alive. Stomachs that were merely cauldrons of acid, bubbling, foaming, always shooting spheres of sliver thin pain into our chests. It was the pain of the terminal ulcer, terminal cancer, terminal parias. The unending pain. And we passed through the cavern of rats. We passed through the path of the boiling steam. We passed through the country of the blind. We passed through the slaw of the despond. We passed through the veil of tears. And we came finally to the ice caverns. Horizonless thousands of miles in which the ice had formed in blue silver flashes, where novas lived in the glass. The down-dropping stalactites and thick as 
glorious as diamonds. They had been made to run like jelly and then solidified in graceful alternities of smooth, sharp perfection. We saw the stack of canned goods, and we tried to run to them. We fell in the snow. We got up and went on. Benny shoved us away and went at them, and pawed them and glummed them and gnawed at them. He could not open them. M had not given us a tool to open the cans. Benny grabbed a three-quart can of guava shells began to batter against the ice bank. The ice flew and shattered, but the can was merely dented. Well, we heard the laughter of a fat lady, high overhead, echoing down and down and down the tundra. Benny went completely mad with rage. He began throwing the cans as we all scrambled about in the snow and ice, trying to find a way to end the helpless agony of frustration. There was no way. Then Benny's smooth mouth began to drool he flung himself on Gorister. In that instant, I felt terribly calm. Surrounded by madness, surrounded by hunger, surrounded by everything about but death, I know death was our, only our way out. Am had kept us alive, but there was a tiny way to defeat him. Not a total defeat, but at least I would settle for that. I had to do it quickly. Benny was eating Gorister's face. Gorister on his side, thrashing in the snow. Benny wrapped around him with powerful monkey legs, crushing Gorster's waist. His hand looked around Gorster's head like a nutcracker, his mouth ripping at the tender skin of Gorster's cheek. Gorster screamed with such jagged edge to violence that stalactites fell. They plunged down softly, erect in the receiving snowdrifts, spears, hundreds of them. Everywhere, protruding from the snow, Benny's head pulled back sharply and gave... Something gave all at once, from a bleeding, raw, white dripping of flesh hung from his teeth. Alan's face, black against the white snow, dominoes and chalk dust. Nimdok, with no expression, and but eyes, all eyes. Gorster, half conscious, Benny, now an animal, I knew. Am would let him play. Gorster would not die. But Benny would fill his stomach. I turned to my right and drew a, hot, a huge ice spear from the snow. On an instant, I drove the great ice point head of me like a battering ram. Braced against the right thigh, I struck Benny on the right side. Just under his ribcage, I drove upward through his stomach and broke inside him. He pitched forward and lay still. Gorster lay on his back. I pulled the spear free and straddled him, still moving, driving the spear straight down his throat. His eyes closed as the cold penetrated. Alan must have realized what I had decided. Even as fear gripped her, she ran at Nimdok with a short icicle. As she screamed and into his mouth, the force of her rush did the job. His head jerked sharply and had nailed to the snow crust behind him, all in an instant. There was an eternity beat of silence and soundless anticipation. I could hear Am draw on his breath. His toys had been taken from him. Three of them were dead. Could not be revived. He could keep us alive by his strength and talent, but he was not God. He could not bring them back. Ellen looked at me, her ebony features stark against the snow that surrounded us. There was a fear and pleading in all the manner and the way she held herself ready. I knew only a heartbeat before Am would stop us. I struck her with, and she folded towards me, bleeding from the mouth. I could not read meaning in her expression. The pain had been too great. He contorted her face. But it might have been a thank you. It's impossible. Please. Some hundreds of years have passed, may have passed, I don't know. Am had been having fun for some time, accelerating and retarding my time since. I will say the word now. Now took ten months to say now. I don't know. I think it had been some hundreds of years. He was furious. He would let, wouldn't let me bury them. It didn't matter. There was no way to dig up the deck plates. He dried up the snow. He brought the night. He roared and sent locusts. And it didn't do a thing. They stayed dead. I'd had him. He was furious, and I had thought... 
Am hated me before. I was wrong. Not even a shadow of the hate he had now. Slavered for every printed circuit. He made certain I would suffer eternally. And could not do myself in. He left my mind intact. I can dream, can wonder, can lament. To remember all four of them. I wish, well, it doesn't make any sense. I know I saved them. I know I saved them from what had happened to me. But still, I cannot forget killing them. Alan's face. It isn't easy. Sometimes I want to. It doesn't matter. M has altered me for his own pace of mind, I suppose. He doesn't want me to run at full speed into a computer bank and smash my skull. Or hold my breath until I faint or cut my throat on a rusted sheet of metal. There are reflective surfaces down here. I will describe myself as I see myself. I'm a great soft jelly thing, smoothly rounded with no mouth, with pulsing white holes filled by fog where my eyes used to be, rubbery appendages that were once my arms, bulks rounding down to lengthless humps of soft slippery matter. I leave a moist trail when I move. Blotches of diseased evil gray come and go on my surface, as though light had is being beamed from within. Outwardly, dumbly, I shamble about a thing that could never have been known as human. A thing whose shape is so alien, a travesty, that humanity becomes obs obscene for the vague re resemblance. Inwardly, alone, here, living under the land, under the sea, under the belly of Am, whom we created because our time was spent badly, and we must have known consciously that he could do it better. At least the four of them are safe at last, and will be the matter for that. It makes me a little happier, and yet Am has won. Simply, he has taken his revenge. I have no mouth, and I must scream. All right, so uh, that was a reading of I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream by Harlan Allison. Now, I realized during that reading, and I did it in pretty much one take, um, that I said aim instead of am. And I said a am before. They had explained what um, am meant. Um, and But it was after am, where they actually... That was intentional, but... As for the aim, I'm sorry. I kind of think of AOL as the enemy. <laughs> so, and that was a long read. Um, if you want to see more of these, just leave a comment below. I'll record it. All right, thank you. Bye.